Um, now, Audubon Rockies is a regional office of a National Audubon Society. And again, my name is Dolly Edmonds, and I've been with Audubon since 2009. And I've been working on uh, the sage grouse issue since 2009. So near and dear to my heart, um, and a lot of ups and downs with this species. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on Audubon Rockies, Audubon Rockies, again, is a regional office of National Audubon Society. Our headquarters are in, is in Fort Collins, so you are currently in my living room in Fort Collins. Um, we have six different programs, our community naturals program, Western Rivers, Habitat Hero, Conservation Ranching, um, Gilmore Sanctuary, which is over in Utah because we cover Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, and finally the Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative. And the Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative is called just that. It's not the Sage Grouse Initiative, it's the Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative, but our species that we really focus on is greater sage grouse. And hopefully you'll, you'll understand why as we get into this presentation. But you um, will be hearing from my colleague, Abby Burke. Um, it sounds like on the next one, which is exciting. So what we're gonna be talking about today is again, greater sage grouse, the biology of greater sage grouse, what's their life history needs, population range, learning about the habitat that they're completely dependent upon, the sagebrush ecosystem. And then we're gonna talk about a little bit about the management, the threats, what, what's going on with their populations, who manages the bird, the habitat. Um, and what I like to joke around is the intrigue. And if you imagine um, there's, you're, you're in an opera and who's the lead of that opera. One of my colleagues um, referenced this not that long ago and I thought, oh my gosh, it's perfect because the main star of the opera is really sage grouse. Um, sage grouse are extremely interesting, the political happenings around this bird. Um, and we're going to wrap up on what's happening today. Um, and Anna Joy will tell you, yes, a lot has happened since the last time I came and, and visited with you all. But again, starting off with biology, they are the um, largest North American um, native grouse species in North America. And for the top is a female. Two to three pounds, size of a football for those that haven't had a chance to um, go to a lek. Um, the males are a little bit larger. They are long lived, uh, long lived being one to three years. They have been documented up to 10 years though. And the reason that we have greater sage grouse as our key species for the sagebrush ecosystem for Audubon is that they are completely dependent on the sage on large tracts of healthy sagebrush ecosystem to survive. It is their refrigerator, it's their kitchen, it's their bedroom, it's, um, it's, their, it's their home. Um, they use sagebrush plants for roosting, for cover, for food. They are omnivores. When they're young, the chicks will eat insects. And so you'll find the chicks oftentimes in more riparian, in wet meadows. Um, and their winter diet is 99% sagebrush leaves and buds, which is pretty amazing. They're the only species that I know of that actually gains weight during the winter time. Now we have long talked about this species. Lewis and Clark actually observed this fowl on their westward um, expedition. They fed at the west as they traveled west and they were also really big part of many um, Native American tribes across the west. Um, and they were referenced, here's a drawing by William Clark on the right hand side of your screen. But what we're talking about tonight is greater sage grouse, which are found up in the northwest corner of Colorado. We are not talking about gunnison sage grouse, which are a different species. Um, and those are found in much smaller populations. But again, we're talking about just greater sage grouse distribution and population. In this map here, we have um, kind of orient you as to where you find sage grouse. Light green is their historic range. Dark green is where they're found today. Um, they occupy only about 56% of their historic habitat. Um, so you used to have them go further into the Dakotas, for example, found throughout Washington and Oregon. Um, and now that it's, it's really retracted. Um, for the most part, the birds are found in Wyoming, Montana, Nevada, and Idaho. We only have about 4% of the birds here in Colorado. However, Colorado is politically very important because of the roles that the governors have played um, in the management of the bird over time. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but again, only 4% of the birds are found here in Colorado. <coughs> Um, when we talk about the sage grouse, we talk about the sage brush ecosystem. Sage brush ecosystem is habitat for 350 plus species. It's a high desert, high elevation ecosystem of four to 9,000 feet height. And you have um, the main anchor 
to this ecosystem are these sagebrush plants. They have a real deep root. So in that graphic on your right hand side of the screen, you see how deep that root goes down. It enables it, this plant, to survive really dry conditions. Um, they can be hundreds of years old. It's really hard to get them to grow, um, but it's really easy to kill them with fire, et cetera, that we'll talk about later. But they have this real deep root system and these plants will catch snow around them. And so they're considered a nurse plant because they'll collect this moisture and provide um, uh, brood rearing habitat for birds, other critters, as well as other plants nearby will find shelter underneath them and, and grow. Now, when we talk about sage grouse, they congregate on lex. Um, and lex, as many of you, I'm sure, are completely familiar with, hopefully hope you've had a chance to actually go visit a greater sage grouse lex, is where males perform these courtship displays. Males will defend these territories. Um, they'll get there ahead of the females. They'll strut around. They will take, their tail feathers will fan out. And they'll emit these amazing drumming sounds from these yellow air sacs which those air sacs will actually collect as much as um, uh, a gallon of air and then they'll push it out. It's a really phenomenal experience. Um, and I know uh, one of my duties at Audubon Rockies is I get to work with a lot of the chapters and we have 11 chapters here in Colorado. We have five in Wyoming, five in Utah. Um, and I know that the Laramie chapter is actually hosting a lecture. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, I, I can connect you and, and let you know when that's going to happen. Um, but anyways, here we have a photo of a couple of males duking it out, trying to get the best position in the lek. Um, there was actually a study that found uh, a single male copulated 37 times with 37 different females in a 37 minute window. It's phenomenal. You'll have one male that tends to do most of the copulation during the, uh, when they're on these leks. These leks will vary in sizes um, and they are not uniformly distributed across the 11 state range. They have this incredible fidelity to these lek sites. Um, and why, why that's important is for management purposes and for understanding the biology of the bird. Um, to the point of my boss, our executive director, Allison Holleran, actually was the first published paper that looked, she got it for her master's that looked at um, sage grouse lex and oil and gas development. It was a while ago that paper was done, but what you, the joke is, if you want to know where oil and gas development is, find a sage grouse lex. Um, there's a lot of, you know, they're in that, in that sagebrush habitat. Um, so going forward with sage grouse, we, we have this mating season generally happens in March. It's happening right now. Um, if you want to Google, uh, there's a lek cam in Oregon um, right now. It's really cool. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of not a lot of males on that lek, uh, but there is a lek cam. Um, and it, it you know mating season can vary depending on where you're at. Um, but these birds are incredibly hardy. They'll go out there. Um, and what is shown here are um, the range again of the bird, and you'll see in dark Dark red is um, where you have your population areas. You have high densities of populations. Um, and so, uh, so you have them concentrated. So again, not all leks are the same. Not all habitat is the same for the bird. Um, some great photos of just sage grouse and how they are camouflaged. Um, that top image, there actually is a female in the sagebrush. Um, if you can see it, she's sitting on a nest. Um, and then on the bottom, you have an image of some of the chicks there. If you haven't seen it yet, there was a phenomenal documentary that came out in 2015. It aired on PBS, uh, PBS Nature. Um, Audubon, uh, our office actually went to Cornell Lab of Ornithology and said, hey, you know, it, it, sagebrush is North America's largest ecosystem. And most people can tell you about the Amazon forest, but they can't tell you about the sagebrush ecosystem. Can you help us raise awareness and do a documentary? And they did, it's called the Sagebrush Sea, it's phenomenal. Um, so that's where some of these images are from. But you'll have a six to nine eggs, they will raise a brood um, and their estimates of how managers determine how grouse populations are doing is when they count them on their legs because that's when they're most visible. Um, and so estimates range anywhere from 200 to 500,000 birds. Now, so now we heard about the biology bird. How about managing the bird? Well, the bird itself is managed by state game and fish agencies. So in Colorado here, it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife. The habitat is managed primarily by federal agencies. Most of the birds are actually found on Bureau of Land Management, uh, managed lands. 
And that again is gonna be really important when we, when we go forward here. This bird is extremely well, uh, well studied, unlike a lot of species that have been listed to be peti or peti uh, petitioned to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. This bird, we have a ton of information on it. Um, there has been a ton of studies. The images here is of um, uh, you actually go out in the middle of the night um, on an ATV, you have one person driving and you do spotlight and you're trying to find the eye shine um, on the birds when they're out on right before they get onto their legs. And you will catch them by putting a big net on them, you'll handle them, put a collar on them and do all kinds of studies to understand um, what they're doing. That um, bottom image, you could also look on Dr. Gail Patricelli um, has done some great studies where she uses these robotic stuffed hens to travel on these tracks around a lek to understand their behavior. So we actually know a lot about greater sage grouse. Um, and what we know is that they have a wide range of threats where what these threats are depend on where you are in their range. And I will admit this map is a mess and it's a mess to try and capture how challenging this species is to manage. Um, on the western portion, one of the major threats is in red and that's invasive plant species and wildfires. On the eastern portion, it's energy development. Uh, we really know that the bird does not do well when you have habitat disturbance and activity, as well as there's a myriad of other threats. But again, those are the two big main threats for this bird. We knew back actually in 1953, this, the, um, the organization West Wafla, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, that's all the different state game and fish agencies coming together and working together. Um, they identified back in 1953 that this species is not doing well. There have been numerous uh, petitions to federally list the species. And then this, this is where the opera kind of starts. In, 20, in 2005, um, in response to one of those petitions, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, you know what? Sage grouse don't warrant federal protection under the Endangered Species Act. And then after that decision came out in 2006, came some of the first public allegations of meddling by US Fish and Wildlife Service top level employee. She was found to personally reverse scientific findings. She changed scientific conclusions. She removed relevant information from documents and she ordered the Fish and Wildlife Service to adopt her edits. She actually resigned shortly before, um, uh, be before it, it, it got real serious. So she resigned, went all back into courts again. A lot of the decisions under her leadership were called into question. And in 2010, following court decision, um, that sage grouse were found to actually warrant federal protection. And this is really important. Please keep this in the back of your mind. At that time, um, the US Fish and Wildlife said, yes, sage grouse should be listed under the Endangered Species Act for two reasons. One, loss or fragmentation of habitat, that sagebrush habitat, loss and fragmentation of it. And secondly, inadequate regulatory mechanisms or inadequate protections. So going forward, okay, all of a sudden, if you remember where sage grouse are found, they're found across the West. When that decision came out in 2010, people lost it. People really freaked out. Um, if you thought the wolf issue was bad, if you thought the spotted owl issue in Northwest was bad, nothing compared to greater sage grouse because they occupied such a larger area um, because they overlapped oil and gas development that hit, real, that hit economies, that overlapped ranching interests, people really got nervous about what would a listing mean. So in 2010, when Fish and Wildlife said, yes, they deserve to be listed, they did something unusual. They said, yes, it deserves to be listed, but we're gonna put you in this gray area, warranted but precluded. So kind of sat in limbo. That actually gave a chance for a lot of the stakeholders to start getting involved and finding a solution. In 2010, things get, again, really kick off. You had the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NRCS, launches the Sage Grouse Initiative, and that is continuing on today. But even in those first two years, $110 million. So this huge effort, unprecedented effort 
towards working with private landowners, using science, trying to improve rangeland productivity. You started to hear the phrase, what's good for the bird is good for the herd. That was referring to cattle. That was referring to mule deer. It brought a lot of people to the table. Again, all of a sudden there's this big shuffle. Remember we talked about the two threats were loss of habitat and lack of protections or unregulated uh, regulatory mechanisms. Remember a lot of the birds are found on the Bureau of Land Management public lands. Well, in response to that, they did a massive overhaul of their federal land management plans. Their resource management plans are the law of the land. They are in place for 10 years. They tell you what you can do, when you can do it. They refer to cultural resources. They refer to recreation. They refer to oil and gas development, you name it. They overhauled 98 of those plans in four years. It was insane. Um, and across 10 different states impacting 67 million acres. And what those management plans did in 2015 when they were finalized was they improved habitat conditions and they endeavored to minimize new disturbances and that affected oil and gas development. In all of this, all these meetings were happening. People were going out on tours, trying to understand what's going on. In that middle picture there, you have uh, my colleague, Brian Rutledge, who is the director of the Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative for Audubon, is meeting with Department of Interior Secretary, um, Sally Jewell at the time in DC. And he brought with him a miner, an oil and gas, um, a county commissioner saying, yes, we can get this done. There was this really great positive momentum of, of wanting to work for the bird. Again, benefits to not just sage grouse, there were all these other species right in the wings too that we knew were not doing well in the sagebrush ecosystem. You have mule deer numbers are declining, pronghorn, white-tailed jackrabbit, all these other species, pygmy rabbits that are not doing well that we believe we're gonna be benefiting by helping to protect the habitat. So while all this is happening, you had a strong public support. 71% um, of voters said, yes, we support in Colorado, we support strong conservation members, uh, conservation efforts. It was, it was a really good time for conservation. It was great to be part of this um, group effort to find real science-based solutions. So after all these plans got done, um, the announcement was again, there's Miss Sally Jewell standing at our own Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge in Colorado. And she makes this big announcement and she is flanked on the stage by governors, federal agency leaders. Um, Brian Rutledge is just right off the image there, but she makes that big announcement that, you know what? All these partnerships, all these, these plans, these 2015 federal management plans, they've addressed the threats we do not need to list the bird. Huge celebration. You have Governor Hickenlooper, again, we talk about Colorado being politically important. He's making all these statements that um, these improvements will enhance not only sage grouse, but all manner of wildlife. That's a crucial part of what makes Colorado and the American West the unique place it is. So just this really positive attitude. And I'd like to joke around that that there was a lot of great social media. People were doing posts, reporters were doing articles about sage grouse. Nobody even knew what they were before this. All of a sudden you're having reporters in Maine, in Korea doing stories. You have tons of social media efforts. Um, my boyfriend at the time, um, Leo, did a post as well about sage grouse. So it was getting a lot of great attention. Meanwhile, all this is happening and Congress is stepping in. <laughs> And there's all this political interference. There's these bills trying to preclude the ability to list the species. There's all these um, really kind of honestly underhanded efforts to um, kind of disrupt efforts around sage grouse management. One of my favorite was saying that sage grouse was actually a threat to security, to national security. Um, and so there were literally bills that we have fought over and over and over again, um, saying it's a threat to national security um, and, and trying to include um, language in national defense authorization bills that funds our federal, our, um, our agencies, our defense, Department of Defense, including language in there about sage grouse. So all of this is happening. Um, and then all of a sudden things change and we get a brand new president. And at that time, shortly after coming into office, uh, President Trump signs an executive order and it's called Promoting Energy Independence and Economic Growth. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. If you remember the 2015 federal management plans, 
worked to address the loss of habitat and to, um, to address regulatory protections. And those regulatory protections included limiting the amount of energy development in the most important sage grouse habitat. Well, in this executive order that was passed, uh, President Trump wanted to review all of those, um, all those uh, policies which were believed to burden the development of energy, energy resources. And so we knew at that point that sage grass were under the gun. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is a big deal because BLM manages 245 million acres in the West. Remember those, those plans that we talked about, those federal plans, all those in yellow, it's a big deal. So in response, President Trump under this um, executive order changed how sage grouse were getting managed through a whole wide suite of federal policies that were passed. Um, he disregarded science and undermined its some major needage of protections. He started a whole federal management plans. So he reviewed those that were passed in 2015. Those plans passed in 2015 were the reason, one of the primary reason that sage grass were determined to not warrant federal protection under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and he also increased oil and gas leasing um, with an energy dominance agenda. All the while, we saw a 44% decline in sage grass populations across the range. We had a backlash. The governors um, came together and were really frustrated with what was happening. Um, especially in the very beginning, because so much effort was put up front by the states to make sure that the species didn't get listed um, under the ESA, avoided the necessity of being listed. Uh, and the governors felt really getting put, like as though they were getting pushed around. So all of a sudden you had those 2015 plans under the energy dominance agenda and a series of efforts by the federal administration, all of a sudden they were reviewing them. And all of a sudden they came out with these new plans and they were approved in 2019, new federal management plans. It reduced protections of over 51 million acres that included here in Colorado. Um, compensatory mitigation was now optional. So if you go out and an energy developer goes out and disturbs and destroys the habitat, it's now voluntary as to whether or not they actually clean up or not. Um, so it becomes optional and also relaxed relaxes protections against oil and gas development and a lot easier for companies to obtain waivers. Under the energy dominance agenda, what did that really mean? Um, there is a lot on this slide and I do apologize, but what I'd like to draw attention to um, is that under the energy dominance agenda, that executive order that Trump signed in March of 2017, um, it facilitated oil and gas development on our public lands. Um, between October 2015 and January 2017, based on the Bureau of Land Management's own data, we found um, that there 7% of the amount of acres leased for oil and gas development mm -hmm. in priority grouse habitat, that dark purple, so the most important sage grouse habitat, the amount of acres leased was 7% out of the total. During just the first part of the Trump administration, between February 2017 through March 2019, that jumped up to 27%. So once a company goes in and gets a, uh, uh, gets, um, a permit to drill, that becomes the primary purpose of that land. And that company has a right to develop it and has 10 years to do so. So it really changes the comp what, that pu what public lands look like and dramatically um, impacts greater sage grouse habitat. The, uh, the permits that were sold during the Trump administration is something that we're gonna be dealing with for a long time to come. As an example um, of just kind of how uh, broken the system was, um, I wanna bring your attention to the Wyoming, an area called the Golden Triangle. It's in central Wyoming. We have the highest concentration of grouse in the world here, 800 males per, per that area in the spring is amazing. Um, it also has really low oil and gas potential. And yet that area was offered um, for oil and gas leasing. And they that earned the, the Bureau of Land Management $404,000. Leases were selling for as low as $2 an acre. Um, so kind of just kind of showed you at that point in time how broken the system was. Um, 
again, we had all these quarterly oil and gas leases. Um, the amount of acres that were being sold was really phenomen phenomenal. Audubon was working really closely um, in arguing for what these lease sales look like. Um, and you are arguing about where they were happening pushing to get acres removed if they were being offered in important grouse habitat and working really closely with the chapters across Colorado. So we now have kind of honestly chaos at the federal administration level. We have chaos happening in Congress at the time. Um, no one is getting anything done and the court intervenes. And in October, 2019, the court stepped in and said, um, basically put a halt to those 2015 plans. And in the court's words, they said that the 2015 plans, um, the impact was to substantially reduce protections for sage grouse. Um, the, that's what the 2019 plans did to the 2015 plans without any explanation for the reductions in the protections um, in habitat and would have um, impacts on population numbers, et cetera, and didn't take into account the best available science. So going forward, now what's happening? So we've talked about the biology, we've talked about the management, how about what's happening today? So when Biden, um, President Biden took office in his very first week, um, folks may remember there was a suite of executive um, actions that were laid out. And it's interesting, the bar graph here, to show how many executive actions were taken during um, Biden's um, just a few days compared to previous presidents. Um, and it is concerning, I think, it says a lot about how we are in politics right now. It's very divisive and it's really unfortunate. Um, and, but he did put out a suite of executive actions um, that tried to address some of the failures, um, whether it, it was confusion in some of the language or just some of the system um, needing some changes. Uh, these executive actions ranged from anywhere around the uh, uh, pandemic um, whether they were reversals in red on the far right, or maybe they were executive actions, just other types of executive actions, um, everywhere from uh, COVID to immigration to regulation, health care. Um, but you'll see that green arrow points to reversals in regards and actions in regards to, um, to the environment. So we started to see a change, which um, as a conservation organization, we were really happy to see. We spent a lot of the previous four years fighting some um, really damaging policies and anti-science policies. Interestingly enough, we have Secretary of Interior, um, Deb Holland is brought in, which is exciting. She is actually, she was formerly a, a Democratic um, representative out of New Mexico and the first indigenous person to run a department. Um, so very exciting. Um, and she also has a lot of background um, that will be helpful in her new role as Secretary of the Interior for Department of Interior, because she actually served as the Vice Chair of the House Natural Resource Committee, um, and also is chair as Chairwoman of the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands. So very well informed. Um, now, for those who are not super familiar with who the Department of Interior is, they're an extremely powerful um, body. Uh, they oversee 11 bureaus, um, including the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Geological Survey. U.S. Geological Survey I'll be talking about as well um, in a little bit, and they are the science arm of the federal agencies. And when we're talking about to what's happening super timely, um, just this past Friday, the Department of Interior issued two secretarial orders. And the first one, secretarial order 3398, revoked a series of Trump era Department of Interior secretarial orders, including the energy dominance agenda. The second secretarial order 3399 talked about a new climate task force at Department of Interior. Um, and this task force is going to coordinate work across the department, the various bureaus, and ensure that climate change is appropriately analyzed and that tribes and environmental justice communities are appropriately engaged. So, you know, we have some real changes happening. 
Um, on top of that, we have new leadership um, as well, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Deputy Director is Nada Culver. Uh, for some of you may recognize Nada Culver because she actually used to work for Audubon. Um, I actually worked with her on a daily basis on Greater Sage Grouse. Uh, she is a lawyer by training. She is extremely familiar with public land law, um, is well respected across the, the spectrum, whether you're an oil and gas company or you're with the conservation community. Um, she is a true asset to the American people and having her in that role. So it's really exciting. So we have some sense of we're getting a change administration. We're actually getting some new science too. There was kind of a quiet in science for a while there, if folks can understand why. There was um, a report put out um, in March called the Sagebrush Conservation Strategy. It's part one of a larger report. And this is a massive 300 plus page document um, that talks about, that lays the foundation of what are the challenges to sagebrush conservation. This was pulled together by 94 different scientists from various federal state agencies and NGOs. Audubon was part of this as well. Um, I'm actually an author in one of the chapters, which is exciting, but it really lays the groundwork for what, um, how the sagebrush ecosystem is doing right now, which not surprisingly is not good. Then there was another publication, uh, uh, publication that came out out of USGS. Again, if you remember, that's the body that does a lot of the science um, for the federal government. Um, and this massive report came out that um, looked at sage grouse across the range. So USGS worked with state agencies, state game and fish agencies. They're the ones that actually um, handle the LEC surveys. So they'll go out there and count the males. USGS took a look at the entire range, worked with the different state game and fish agencies to understand how are sage grouse doing. And what they found, this is for the entire range, um, while there is a report that has come out, they're also gonna be doing some peer reviewed publications. Um, so what they found is when you're looking going back all the way from 1965, an annual decline of 3%. And you'll notice that grouse numbers go up and down, they're cyclical. However, again, you're still seeing a decline. Not only are you seeing a 3% annual decline, they found that since 1965, 80% of grouse are gone. Since 1965, 80%. On top of that, they looked, they looked at a whole bunch of things, but they also took a look at where are these different leks and which ones are most vulnerable. Um, and just as just a snapshot, again, this is all this is all gonna, this is in their report, but they're gonna be peer-reviewed publications as well. Um, the darker the number, the higher the probability that that lek is gonna blink out, that they're gonna ex be extirpated. Those darker numbers you'll notice are on the edges of the, peri the periphery of the range. So again, all kinds of information that can be really be used by managers to try and understand what's going on going forward. Um, we all, they also took a look at um, how many LECs, how LECs are gonna do in the short term in the next 19 years, midterm, 38 years, and going down even further, 56 years from now. If you were to toss a coin, 50% probability of extirpation, they're predicting that 78% of leks are gonna be extirpated in 56 years. So again, sage grouse are not doing well. Um, let's see, oops, let's see, it's not advancing. Hold on one second, let's see. Hmm, okay. So they're also finding that Western populations are declining faster than Eastern population. Remember Western population is where you were finding um, uh, more of the fire invasive annual grasses. Eastern population is where you're seeing a lot of the oil and gas development. So even though you're seeing a lot of leasing happening, you're seeing loss greater in the Western portion. Let's see if I can advance it. There we go. Okay. So what's happening in the Western portion? I did send you all um, a link in the chat box for some great videos to talk about cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is nasty. Um, for those that have dogs, it, it gets in boots, it gets in their snouts, it's a real problem, um, gets in their paws. Um, but cheatgrass are really horrible for the ecosystem as well. Um, they come from Asia. Um, this, this plant is not an invasive species in Asia. It came here and it is actually, it greens up 
before our native plants and goes to seed before our native plants. So that's how it outcompetes. You get any disturbance in the, in the habitat and cheatgrass is quick to get in there. Um, it also spreads really quickly um, and is provides great fuel for fire. It is often kind of referred to as a matchstick out there. So once you have cheatgrass come in, fire comes in, and it's so prone to fire that then fire kills these sagebrush plants, which again is that dominant feature in the ecosystem. It's sage grouse's bedroom, kitchen, you name it. Um, and then once the habitat is disturbed, more cheatgrass comes in. Cheatgrass has really dramatically changed the sagebrush ecosystem across the West, especially um, around Idaho, Nevada, Washington. Um, and you used to be where cheatgrass or fires in the sagebrush ecosystem would happen every 50 to 100 years. Because of cheatgrass, because of these other invasive species, we're now seeing every five to 10 years. They're more frequent, they're hotter, and they're larger fires. Um, to the point that, in fact, uh, in Washington, um, the state of Washington is in the process of um, debating, of determining whether or not they're going to um, change the protection status, state level protection status of greater sage grouse to endangered because of all the massive fires caused by cheatgrass last year. It really destroyed the grouse populations and the habitat. Even just 1% of cheatgrass would double the risk of wildfires. Um, and I did again put in the chat box those two short videos. Um, what I will say is, is when I work with chapters and I work with, with folks um, in the public about that, if people don't know there's an issue, they can't care. Um, so I please do consider sharing these links with family and friends, post them on social media um, because we really, it, it's dramatically changing what public lands look like across the West. Um, just to give you a sense of, of what am I talking about, um, let's just take a look again at, at greater sage grouse habitat um, going back from 2016, that far right column, annually until 2020. Um, the rows show you the, who owns the land. Are we talking about BLM land? Are we talking about Fish and Wildlife Service? Maybe it's a refuge um, or is it private land, state lands? The bottom line is the total. In 2016, we only had, you know, 626,000 acres of land burned, greater sage grouse habitat burned. In just a couple of years, that quadrupled to over 2 million acres. And then we had a little bit of lag, but then look at 2020 again. Um, and there remain some real concerns about what does fire look like in this next season. Um, we have more fires happening in rangeland than we do in forest service land, and it's in forested land and it's dramatically underfunded. So one of the things that we're doing um, is trying to encourage Congress to spend appropriate money on, on, on habitat restoration, um, on addressing wildfires, on preventing wildfires, um, and dealing with all these invasive species. At the bottom of your screen is an action alert um, that it would be wonderful to try and speak up um, Congress is currently in the middle of having, um, of starting some conversations about how they're going to fund a lot of our federal agencies and Audubon is pushing really hard with conservation partners, both at the state level and at the federal level to make sure that our agencies are adequately funded to be able to fight um, what's happening across the range with cheatgrass um, because what we're seeing is it's going to impact not only Western communities, but wildlife like sagegrass. So that is the end of my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions that folks might have.